NYU have done considerable research, especially on adolescents, but I think it applies by extension probably also to young adults, on the relationship between screen time and mental health. And basically, I'm not going to present that data today, but basically a direct linear relationship um, for children and adolescents between the amount of time spent on screens and poor mental health outcomes. And it's not just being on the screen, but the kinds of things that people are engaging with online, even if it's not really toxic things like pornography, even just social media, I think can be a really tough challenge for young people to navigate because there's almost an unconscious comparison game that's always happening when you're engaging with friends or followers on social media. And part of this comes from the fact that what you see in regards to other people on social media is not their true reality, right? So you're, you're unconsciously playing a comparison game about how do I measure up to these other people that are posting beautiful photos on Instagram, right? And you think about the way people present themselves online with social media. You know, they usually don't post the photo, photo of their forlorn face after they got a D on their, you know, first midterm exam, mm -hmm. freshman year of college. They post the amazing <coughs> spring break photos of the European vacation that they went on with their family. Over the summer, you see the airbrushed version of other people's lives, and you can forget that, in fact, any unconscious comparison or conscious comparison that I'm engaged in here is always going to be a losing proposition. You're never going to measure up because you're not comparing yourself to real people. You're comparing yourself to the part of people that they want to project to others online. And that can have negative consequences on self-confidence and on um, adolescent and early adult development. Eric Erickson, who's sort of a major theorist in the field of development, talk not just about child development, but he looked at developmental stages across the entire lifespan. And he characterized each stage as having particular challenges that a person had to master sort of before they could move on to the other stage. So he talked uh, of adolescence, for example, in terms of struggling with issues related to identity, right? You think about your typical high school kid. Who, who am I? Which peer group do I fit into? What am I good at? Um, where do I fit in? Right? This is common struggle of adolescent life, and he thought you have to achieve sort of a certain level of solidity in that stage of life to move on to the next sort of early adulthood phase, the more college age uh, phase of developing <coughs> the ability to engage in committed, intimate relationships, sort of the, the young adult project. I mean, the characteristic sort of prototypical example that we talk about is marriage, right? College is the time that you begin to think about um, finding a spouse, or at least what kind of person you might want to look look for if you're drawn to the vocation of marriage. Um, but at the same time, Eric said, okay, this is a prototypical example, but the, the, the ability to develop sort of long-term committed relationships, friendships, right, that can last a lifetime, very common experience for people that are fortunate enough to form solid friendships in college. They still get together years later and have that, that bond that was forged in the dorm room. Uh, and, and this kind of idea of committing to something outside of myself that happens in these kinds of relationships, whether it's authentic friendship or, or marriage, a serious courtship that might lead to marriage, can also be applied to sort of committing my life to worthy causes, not, not just other people, but, but higher ideals about professional life and vocation. And these, these are obvious challenges I think that college students are also contending with during their time uh, at the university. It also just so happens that this phase of life, uh, undergraduate and graduate age students, this phase of life happens to be the phase where many common mental health conditions first manifest. That's just the natural history of many of these illnesses. Depression can present really across the lifespan, but quite common for people to have their first episode of major depression if they're prone to that in college. Bipolar disorder, manic depressive illness, tends to present between the age of 18 and about 25. So very common for a college age student to have their life severely, sort of life trajectory severely interrupted by a first manic episode 
depressive phase of bipolar illness while they are in college. Um, Trauma-related disorders, especially sexual trauma, unfortunately, are all too common among college-age students. And even uh, severe and persistent mental illnesses, chronic mental illnesses like schizophrenia, very often first present in this age cohort. So schizophrenia tends to first manifest for the first psychotic episode, the psychotic break. For men, a little younger than women. So men age 20 to 30, women age 25 to 35. So especially among undergraduate men, this may be a period of time where even an illness like schizophrenia can manifest. And there are, there are many other examples. So all of this adds up to a period of time in which students are vulnerable to serious mental health challenges. And also, in this next section, I'm going to spend a few minutes on on top of that, unfortunately, there's been an additional burden of the lockdowns and the school closures, the effects of which I believe we are still seeing among undergraduate and graduate students on campus who <coughs> have lived through at least part of their high school experience, maybe part of their college experience, contending with trying to do school remotely, contending with going to campus and then being sent home for a period of time during lockdowns and school closures. I don't know sort of how that all played out here in Texas, uh, certainly in California, as in I think many places around the country. This had, this, these kinds of policies at the state level had a pretty severe effect on undergraduates. My first foray into sort of becoming a critic of our pandemic response actually happened in 2020 when I was seeing as a psychiatrist a few weeks into the lockdowns that we had in California, the effects that this was having on people's mental health that were just presenting to clinic uh, that I was seeing in the resident clinic that I supervised or that I was seeing in my own uh, private practice. And I was, I was seeing sort of apocalyptic fears, not among people that, that were paranoid or delusional, but, but people dealing with sort of run-of-the-mill depression or anxiety that literally felt like the world was, was coming to an end. It was so obvious to me that these policies were harmful in terms of the mental health outcomes. And I was sort of frustrated that that was not part of the public conversation in terms of weighing not only the potential benefits of locking down to control the spread of COVID, but also the downstream harms that needed to be weighed against those benefits. And my initial concerns were confirmed by a study that came out in the summer of 2020, that unfortunately, this was a CDC study, but unfortunately, unlike things that CDC was saying about COVID, this got virtually no media attention. It didn't become part of the public conversation that year. And this study had some really staggering numbers that, that you, you just don't see this kind of thing in psychiatric epidemiology in terms of changes from one year to the next. So this is a population-based study of over 5,000 Americans. Um, that four in 10 reported some kind of mental health condition that they were struggling with during the pandemic. A quarter of people uh, reported a trauma or stressor-related disorder that was related to the lockdowns or school closures that they had endured at that point for many months. Aaron, tell us, like, how, how did they end? Did they have a list of things they could pick? Yeah, so this, I mean, this was, this was a survey that had um, sort of did some effort at symptomatic checklist to, uh, it's, it's not a perfect diagnostic tool. Um, and so the, the results were not uh, presented in terms of this many people met the criteria for major depressive disorder or PTSD or whatever, because the study methodology was not sufficient to make a diagnosis. But uh, you know, this percentage of people reporting a significant cluster of symptoms or significant number of symptoms consistent with these disorders. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and the, the self-reported um, people that had significant issues with anxiety or depression had tripled uh, in the case of anxiety and quadrupled in the case of depression between the same month in 2019 and June of 2020. As I said, you just don't see this kinds of enormous leaps in psychiatric epidemiology from one year to the next. The most concerning statistic to me was that 
Uh, one in ten Americans reported that not at any point during their lifetime, but sometime within the last 30 days, they had seriously contemplated suicide. And if you break that number down by age bracket, 24%, one quarter of young adults reported that they had seriously contemplated suicide sometime in the last 30 days. That number um, terrified me. Higher rates among uh, ethnic minorities too, which is unusual. Whites typically have higher rates of suicide and suicidal ideation than blacks and Hispanics. So this was also a, a, a new reversal of a trend. This is, um, this is data from, I believe this is Gallup. Uh, they, a four point sort of Likert scale type study where they said, basically self-report, you consider your own mental health or emotional well-being to be excellent, good, fair, and you see the trend line from when they started doing the survey, I think in 2001, um, you know, hovering around, uh, you know, 80 to 90% of Americans said their, their emotional well-being was either good or excellent. And then we get a nine point drop in 2020. And we get a nine point drop uh, in 2020 also in people who reported that their mental health was excellent. Even prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of concern at the national level regarding so-called deaths of despair, death by suicide, alcohol-related illnesses, and drug abuse. And Anne Case and Angus Deaton, Deaton is a Nobel Prize-winning economist, so two social science researchers at Princeton published first a, 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 a white paper and then later turned that into a book in, I believe it was 2018, describing that rising rates of death and despair starting in 1999 um, and, and accelerating around 2006 and you know basically taking on such severe proportions by 2018 even pre-pandemic that due to these deaths alone and the effects that they had on overall mortality in the United States life expectancy among Americans was dropping in 2018 for the first time since the Great Depression because of alcohol, drug, and suicide. Then we locked down and closed the schools. We had the effects that I showed you in the last slide. We sort of poured gasoline on that fire. So in the year, two, uh, in the year 2000, there were less than 20,000 drug overdose deaths per year in the United States. By 2018, uh, Pre-pandemic, that number had increased to 70,000. Uh, by 2020, during the lockdowns, that number was 100,000. It's, it's a lot of people, right? And did did you hear about that excess mortality of 30,000 people due to drug overdose during COVID? When you turn on the evening news, no, everyone was focused on one illness rather than doing what public health is supposed to do, which is the health of the population as a whole, not just one disease. Same thing happened to alcohol-related deaths, right? 69,000 to 99,000 uh, in one year uh, from 2019 to 2020. Yeah. Alcohol poisoning? So that would be things like um, liver cirrhosis, uh, alcohol poisoning, delirium tremens, uh, things of that nature. So alcohol-related deaths are a little more complicated because they can be acute. Um, but they can also be chronic illnesses caused by, you know, decades of persistent alcohol use. Um, sorry to be a, a little bit depressing, but in this sort of midsection of the talk, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about suicide. Because um, suicide is a proxy for mental health as a whole, right? It's sort of the canary in the coal mine that something's <coughs> not wrong when you see rising rates of suicide. Suicide is one of those things that human nature being what it is, sad to say, never fully eradicate it, probably. Um, but there is wide variation uh, across different societies and across different periods of time in suicide rates. And starting with the seminal work of Emil Durkheim, one of the founding fathers of modern sociology, who published a book on suicide in, I believe it was 1892 or 1894, there's been a recognition of broader social and cultural factors playing a role in terms of rates of of suicide. The other reason I want to talk about suicide is, I mean, I could go through all the different mental health disorders, but, you know, most of the people in the audience here are probably thinking, well, I'm not a mental health professional, maybe I'm just 
student, so I'm not an expert in intervening with, I'm not a therapist or a doctor prescribing antipsychotic or antidepressant medication. What, you know, what can I do about mental health problems on campus? And I actually think there's a lot that all of us can do about mental health problems on campus. So I'll talk a little bit at the end of the talk about, I think, what we can do. Um, but I think when we talk about suicide, um, you'll see in a few minutes uh, that the importance of relationships, the importance of communities of support, the importance of places where people can go to find a sense of meaning and purpose and regain hope that can get them through difficult times or through a crisis. And that's something that I think is, you know, just to borrow a buzzword from people that I generally don't like, a whole of society approach um, is necessary to address the suicide crisis. But first, the bad news. Uh, we just got the CDC numbers for 2022 suicide, and they're the worst that we've ever seen. So almost 50,000 Americans died last year of suicide. The worst moment of, of the pandemic for me was December of, it was not actually getting fired from the University of California. It was December of 20, uh, 2020 when a young man, 17 years old, who I've known literally since he was born, uh, best friends with my 17-year-old son, growing up, uh, ended up taking his own life. Uh, he was struggling with depression and the loneliness and isolation of school closures had, had contributed to that. Just three, four days before he died, uh, a 14-year-old living in his neighborhood had taken his own life using the very same method, the same means. So last year, suicide was the worst it's ever been in the United States. Um, suicide rates, like deaths and despair, had been rising since 1999. Uh, that trend also accelerating around 2006. Suicide is now the 10th leading cause of death overall in the United States among young people. It's the second leading cause of death after motor vehicle accidents. Uh, teen suicide has tripled over the last half century. Um, and we're seeing a lot more young people presenting to emergency rooms with suicide attempts or suicidal ideation. All right, so. A show of hands, who's at high risk for suicide? Raise your hand if you think men are at high risk for suicide. Raise your hand if you think women are at high risk for suicide. Raise your hand if you think it's a trick question because there, there's no difference between them. Okay, it's a little bit of a trick question because the answer is sort of interesting, but, but most of you got, got it right. It turns out that uh, women attempt suicide three times as often as men but men complete suicide four times as often as women, which seems paradoxical. You'd think if they were making more attempts, they would have more completed suicide. But it turns out that men tend to use more violent means than women. Guns, hanging, or jumping from a height of more than 350 feet, pretty definitive methods. Whereas women tend to uh, use drug overdose or cutting. Fortunately, most medications are not lethal in overdose, and even the ones that can be, there's usually a lag period where someone can intervene, you can go to the ER. Uh, and with, with cutting, which can obviously be, be very lethal if you hit the radial artery or the carotid arteries, um, there's still a lag time where people can change their mind, call the ER, maybe they clot, maybe they have someone walk in and see them in the bathtub or whatever. So here's, here's the trend <coughs> line up to, this slide actually needs to be updated. But there was a study looking at 1999 to 2014, and you see men at the top, uh, women at the bottom of the, the combined total. But unfortunately, among every age group except for those over the age of 75, suicide has been on the rise since 99 among both men 
this has been replicated by much more rigorous non-anecdotal social science research since then. Uh, there's also something that's been coined the Papageno effect, and this is sort of this is a silver lining uh, piece of information. The Papageno uh, term comes from a character in Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, who's tempted to suicide and feeling is despairing, and he's visited by these sort of childhood spirits that encourage him to find hope and gain a new perspective on his life. And he changes his mind, chooses to live. And it's also been well characterized that when you have publicized cases of people who were tempted to suicide, but uh, were able to recover from their depression, or were able to uh, contend with the challenges that were leading them to despair, and found meaning, purpose, and hope again, that that can have a salutary effect on suicide rates. So the social contagion element can run in both directions. Nicholas Christakis, who's written a book on this, he's a social scientist at Yale, or he was at Yale, he was now. Um, his research has looked at the way that both positive and negative health-related behaviors spread person to person through social networks. So you have a phenomenon of publicized cases in the newspaper. Um, and there are journalistic, journalistic standards very often not followed um, that in terms of reporting on suicides to try to minimize the worthy of that. Right? You're not supposed to describe the means and method. You're not supposed to describe the location. You're not supposed to frame suicide as a potential problem to a difficult life situation. Uh, but Christakis uh, looked at how suicide spreads person to person through informal social networks even when cases are not publicized. And he found that uh, the effects of a suicide on a social network run up to three degrees of separation. So in other words, if, God forbid, I take my own life tomorrow, the people who know me, family, friends, colleagues, have a higher, statistically significant, higher incidence of suicide over the next year. And my suicide affects not just my friends or direct contacts, but my friends' friends' friends. The effect diminishes with each degree of separation, but it's still significantly, uh, statistically significant at three degrees of separation, which is a, a remarkable finding if you think about it, the effect that our actions have on other people. There's also this phenomenon of suicide hotspots. Anyone know what the number one not that you would know this, it's just like a morbid statistic. What's the number one suicide spot in the world? Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. So, uh, at least 1,800 people, probably many more, these are the ones that we know about, have died from the Golden Bridge. Almost impossible to survive that jump. Uh, the city a few years ago finally put up a, a net a barrier. Um, but prior to that, it was about one suicide every two weeks. And only a couple of dozen people have miraculously survive that job. So that was a hot spot, a sort of romanticized idea. You, know, you know how many people have, that we know of have jumped from the adjacent Bay Bridge? Zero, right? It's just not, it's not a sexy way to go out and sort of claim <laughs> of glory. Who wants to jump from the Bay Bridge? It's ugly. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not romanticized. There was a suicide hot spot in Japan back in the 1930s. There's a famous actress who uh, whose memoirs were published posthumously, um, who jumped into this volcano off the coast of Japan, and her case was widely publicized. And Mount Mahara became a suicide hotspot. There was a man who ran a, a tugboat service and would sell one-way tickets out to the island for people that were jumping. He would also sell round-trip tickets for people who wanted to go and watch people jumping. And uh, this rash of suicides at Mount Mahara didn't stop until they put up a barrier at the spot where people typically jumped, and they also the government forbid selling one-way tickets out to the island. Um, I wrote this uh, review in First Things a couple of years ago. Any of you seen this show? Um, you probably yeah. So uh, th this was an example of I, I think romanticizing suicide. This, this show was a sort of revenge fantasy on Netflix. Very popular when it came out. Um, that I argued was uh, probably contributing to adolescent suicide. And there were a couple of studies published showing that um, 
you know, during the binge watch uh, weeks after the show came out, that that there were more adolescents presenting to emergency rooms with suicide ideation. So it's important. It's important when these things happen that we not glamorize it. And that it's very important to pay attention to how these things are framed in the news media, on social media, um, on campus, in obviously in in entertainment as well. Uh, but another aspect of suicide that I think is important for everyone to understand is uh, the, the typical mindset of someone who's suicidal is, is conflicted, it's divided. Most suicidal people, it's going to sound weird to say, they don't want to die. They want to escape what they perceive, what they feel like is intolerable suffering, and they mistakenly believe this is the only way to escape intolerable suffering. So there was a journalist who tracked down those as many as he could of those 26 people who survived and asked them a very interesting question. What was going through your mind in the four seconds, which is how long it takes, between when you jump and when you hit the water? And every single one of them said the same thing. They said, I regretted my decision to jump. Um, one man said, I instantly realized that all the problems in my life that I thought were unsolvable were actually solvable, except for having just jumped. Um, this guy, Kevin Hine, there's, there's groups of volunteers that patrol the Golden Gate Bridge before they put up the net. They would just walk up and down if they saw someone who looked like, you know, they were contemplating suicide. They would try to intervene and get them help and talk to them. And a, another study by a guy at Berkeley of 800 people who had an intervention on these volunteers indicated uh, almost all of them were grateful that someone had intervened. One of the reasons for this is uh, there's a lot of risk factors for suicide, which I, I'm not going to get into in this talk. But um, but if you if you if you look at all the different risk factors, age, economic status, chronic pain, medical illnesses, mental health conditions, addictions, all the rest of it, there's many things that contribute to suicide risk. But Aaron Beck, who's famous in my field for developing cognitive therapy for depression did a couple of studies following suicidal people out 10 years. It's hard to do these longitudinal studies with um, individuals who have attempted suicide. Uh, but he managed to do this 10-year prospective longitudinal study, both with inpatients who have been hospitalized after a suicide attempt and outpatients who, uh, who are at high risk of suicide and had contemplated suicide. And he found that of all the risk factors, the one that was most predictive long-term of death by suicide. It was not any of those other things that I just mentioned. It was the person's reported sense of hopelessness. So as Victor Frankl taught us, people can endure horrible things if they can maintain hope that the future may be better, a reason to go on living, a way to find meaning even in and through their suffering, and when you lose hope, there is your candidate for suicide. In fact, in, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, he describes the fact that in Auschwitz, they could see when a prisoner had lost hope and had sort of given up. The light would sort of go out of his eyes. And inevitably, that person would come down with an infectious illness and die, or they'd fall back in formation and be shot, or they'd be singled out the crematorium. And this was so like clear and well known among the camp prisoners that they had a name for it, which I'm not going to but butcher the German, but roughly translates the walking dead. Right? The person who has um, who has entered into a state of despair when they've lost hope um, is not long for this world. Right? Hopelessness can literally kill you. But the upside of that is that any intervention, doesn't have to be a professional mental health intervention, any intervention that can help a person regain a sense of hope, or find a sense of meaning or purpose, or make sense out of their suffering, can potentially be life-saving. And that's something that friends can help with, that's something that roommates, parents, professors, uh, people involved in uh, engaging in small-scale communities, uh, and institutions like, like the Austin Institute, all of us have a role there. Um, 
going back to Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winning Deaths of Despair guy, he's an economist, and, but he admitted in his study of Deaths of Despair, economic explanations alone are insufficient here. Um, actually, wealth is not very predictive at all of suicide. Once you get out of basically really grinding poverty, more money does not lower your risk of suicide, once you can provide for the basics. And he said, no, look, the, the real problem with this is that people have lost the narrative of their lives. And he, he I don't think he's a religious believer, but he was digging into issues related to uh, family stability and spiritual fulfillment, kind of meaning and purpose, to try to explain what's going on with the epidemic of deaths and despair. Loneliness is a very serious problem in the United States as well. Also, pre-pandemic, exacerbated by lockdowns and school closures. Prior to the pandemic, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy had declared that loneliness was a public health crisis. Um, if you compare Americans in the 1980s to Americans uh, in 2018, you ask a, a very simple survey question, do you have a person in your life with whom you can discuss important family member, a friend, a colleague. You're going through some personal difficulty. You have someone you can talk to about that. In the 1980s, it's sad to say, 20% of Americans said, no, I don't have any person in my life. This is kind of a proxy for loneliness. And there's been many other studies of loneliness that use different proxies for loneliness. Um, you know, one in five Americans back in the 1980s, that number doubled uh, by 2018. So 40% of Americans say they have no one in their life with whom they can discuss important matters. That's really heartbreaking. Um, and you might think, well, loneliness is kind of, you know, that's sad for people, but I don't know that that's gonna have a profound effect on their, on their physical or mental health. Why is the Surgeon General getting involved in loneliness? This sounds like sort of medical overreach or medicalization of everyday life. Well, it turns out loneliness has very profound effects, both on physical um, which actually shouldn't surprise us because, you know, human beings are hardwired to connect. We're built to be in relation to other people. We, we literally do not function uh, at a very basic biological or neurobiological level without strong social connections. One of the most severe forms of punishment, I would argue it's actually a form of torture, that we're going to inflict on another human being is prolonged solitary confinement. You leave someone in soli solitary confinement for long enough, uh, they eventually become psychotic. They, they lose touch with reality. Their mind becomes unglued. Here you have uh, Murthy's successor, you know, talking about the effects on medical health as well as the loneliness. Uh, I mentioned Durkheim, who looked at this issue of social connection. Um, and he did have a category of suicide where sort of uh, highly controlled societies um, could actually have increased rates of suicide, where people didn't feel that they had enough freedom and individuality. Um, and, you know, Japan has certain periods of history and so forth. But if you look at Western societies, the two categories that, um, sorry, uh, that were most prominent were what he called egoistic and anomic suicide, which involved a lack of integration in a community, or um, the struggles that people undergo during periods of social and economic upheaval. I would argue that we're, we have been in just such a period over the last few years in this country where 
maybe some sense of the current uh, mental health problem or crisis among young people. What, what can we do? And I want to talk about, a few minutes ago, we talked about inter interventions that each of us can implement in our lives and that we think about in terms of becoming more resilient ourselves. Um, obviously, the last one on this list is if you get to the point where symptoms of depression, anxiety, trauma, uh, or use of drugs or alcohol is impairing your ability to function day to day, it's, it's time to go to the student mental health center and seek some professional help and some, some therapy, possibly an evaluation from a psychiatrist for medications. But I don't I want to focus on that today other than recommend it uh, for you or your friends uh, when that's necessary. Um, I want to focus on kind of good habits that each of us can develop. So mood disorders are very tied to our circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle. And college is a time where many students have very poor sleep hygiene, pulling all-nighters, staying up late, <coughs> partying, uh, you know, sleeping in until noon and so forth. Um, if there's one uh, sort of behavioral intervention that everyone could do that would likely improve everyone's mental health, it would be to get up at a fixed time every day, which eventually, if you do that consistently, will force you to go to bed at more or less the same <coughs> time every night and entrain your hypothalamus to get into a good sleep-wake cycle. Go out in the morning early, sometime within an hour of getting up. You know, have your cup of coffee outside, especially in the fall as the days are shortening. Uh, and get some of that UV light to hit your retina, which will go back through the optic nerve and into the Balance, which will not only set your circadian rhythm, but also modulate your cortisol, your morning, uh, your morning endogenous caffeine. Um, we are we're in an environment where artificial lighting, or screens, where the, the natural rhythms of the sun coming up, the sun going down, we're very detached from, and that this actually has profound effects uh, for us physically. And, um, and downstream effects on our mood that are, you know. So social rhythms, regular meal times, uh, not eating alone, a reasonable schedule that's balanced, that has obviously time for study and work, 
instrumentalize religion, right? If you, if you only pray in order to lower your blood pressure, you're not really praying. Right? But if, if, you're, if you're so inclined to some of these pursuits, I think one thing that people on college campuses can do is to encourage this, and, and encourage an environment <coughs> where students are, are free and supported in, um, in their religious faith and their spiritual pursuits. So I'll just mention one study looking at suicide risk. This is from my friend Tyler Vanderweel, who runs the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard. Um, this was published in JAMA. He looked at this very large cohort, almost 90,000 women. This was a study of nurses, actually, um, between 96 and 2010. And, uh, and he found that if you attended a religious service once a week or more, these were Catholics and Protestants that he was looking at, they were five times less likely to uh, complete suicide. And of the almost 7,000 Catholic women who said they attended Mass more than once a week, uh, there were no suicides in, uh, in this particular study over that uh, time frame. And it turned out, in this study, it was religious practice more than self-identified affiliation that was predictive of good suicide outcomes, right? So if you're baptized, you never go to church, it's uh, not sort of a constitutive part of your life, your suicide rates were more or less the same as the general population. Um, so it, it appeared that actually engagement with a religious community, engagement in practices of communal worship, uh, was, there was something about that that was protected. And this, this, this is actually a well-known finding within St. Patrick. It's not controversial, it's not disputed that uh, religious faith and practice lowers the risk of suicide. It's one of the uh, most well-studied protective factors in, uh, against suicide in psychiatry. There's, there's three different hypotheses, all of which I think are probably true, to explain these findings, which have been replicated many times. One is that in some non-specific way, similar to other institutions, people find social connections in religious communities, and that will lower the risk of suicide. Um, another hypothesis that has considerable support for it is that all of the major world religions, but especially uh, Christianity and Judaism have strong moral prohibitions against suicide, or at least suicide is strongly frowned upon as for bad karma. Um, and these moral convictions can be one of the things that helps people persevere even when they're suffering extreme anguish and tempted to suicide. I remember one patient who, who told me um, that if it were not for my relationship with Jesus, I would have killed myself a long time ago. And I absolutely believe that statement is, was 100% true in, in her case. Um, and then the other, uh, the other hypothesis that's been put in that I think has a lot of uh, research in, in support of it is that religious faith is not the only, but one of the key ways that many people find a transcendent sense of meaning and purpose, find a way to make sense out of their suffering and place it in a broader context. Um, I think the last thing that, um, that I'll present in terms of what can be done, and I think this is relevant for the Austin Institute, is that there are need for, there's a need for small communities of like-minded people that are not instrumental. Small communities of like-minded people. The Austin Institute, <coughs> I promise they didn't give me to say this. Like the Austin Institute for Studies of Marriage and Death, uh, that treat people as ends and not instrumentally as means to another end. Which, by the way, the University of Texas does not love you. Right? You are you students are a means to an end to the University of Texas. I'm sorry to break it to you, but this institution does not care about you. Uh, they care about money and not being public. And that's true of every university. I'm not picking on UT. It's true of every university, even some of the other ones. Um, we need small scale institutions and communities that care about, and not just, you know, you're here paying tuition for the next four years, but care about your long term good. And by the way, there are professors here, there are many people here at the university who care about your long term good. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not saying that nobody at the University of Texas cares about it. I'm saying that institutionally, the logic of how institutions operate uh, is not uh, generally what the 
advocating for it here. Research suggests that uh, communities that are multi-generational, where you have undergraduates, graduates, professors, and older adults in the community getting together to get to know one another, and to share ideas, and to engage in a reading group, and to you know, form friendships in that context. Um, that that's very important, right? Just hanging out with your own peer age group and no one else is not great for child, adolescent, or early adult development. Um, so I, I think the work that you're doing here and other similar initiatives, probably there are many more on campus here, hopefully, and I know that there are many more elsewhere. These, these are very important to address the toxic environment issues, to address some of the larger social and cultural issues that are, that are undermining uh, people's strong connections with one another, uh, that are leading to the kind of alienation, ennui, that the problems of Durkheim described 100 years ago, that are now, once again, contributing to suicide, deaths of despair, rising rates of depression, and anxiety, and so forth. So I'll end with um, just a little anecdote to remind us that, OK, you know, get involved in institutions or projects. Or, but at the end of the day, the, the most important thing is probably friendships and, and the little things. Do I, do I form relationships with fellow students, with roommates, um, that are sufficiently strong that people can come to me when they're struggling so that I can maybe OK, I don't have all the expertise here. I don't know how to fix your problem. But I can encourage you that you can, you know, you can recover from depression. And you, know, you can get help. And it's OK to do that. It's not a character flaw or sign of weakness for you to ask for help. Right? And even people that we just encounter on an occasional or even a one-time basis, I think, I, I, think we don't, I think we underestimate the profound effects that we can have on one another. Uh, there's a story reported in the New Yorker several years ago of a, a man who died jumping from the Golden Gate Bridge. And his psychiatrist went with the medical examiner to his apartment uh, where they found his diary after his death. There was an entry written just hours before his death that said, I'm going to walk to the bridge, and if one person smiles at me along the way, I will not jump. So on that note, uh, have hope, take courage, and don't forget uh, the profound effects of both positive and negative.
because it's it, a it's presenting to primary care practitioners, and we never got the training before, and there aren't enough mental health um, professionals to care for these, and so there's there, there's a lot of looking around and trying to figure out ways to address this problem because there's a, a severe shortage relative to the demand yeah. uh, for these uh, for this uh, care. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of this is. Anyone in primary care will tell you that much of what they do and, and, and the recent corner the news, is dealing with mental health issues. The last couple of weeks, I mean, it's been the news that ERs are basically overwhelmed with suicidal kids, pediatric ERs, and so they can't, they, and they don't know where to send them. They have to be screened and then accepted for you know mental health hospitals, and then they're so they're filling up the ERs, and then the you know kids would. Other illnesses can't be seen, and so it's it's causing a, a lot of uh, dislocation. I mean, to me, this is a sign, perhaps the, the most, uh, the loudest sign, that we now live in a society that is basically hostile to children. It's, it's not, it's not good. I wish I could be more optimistic. It's not, it's not a happy Well, talking about loneliness for kids, Talking about loneliness for kids, it's much yeah, yeah. probably mm -hmm. a thing now, which mm -hmm. wasn't. I think, with, yeah, I mean, you're just seeing earlier and earlier engagement with, with media, with social media, with entertainment media, of children, with the advent of these devices. I, I don't know how to account for it all. I don't know exactly what's going on with childhood suicide, but um, it's gone from exceptionally rare to I, I have a practical question. Well, yeah. I'm a face person. But for those of us who work at the university or teach, uh, I believe that there's been an increase in the amount of mental health issues that our students have. So we get all the accommodations. Yeah. And there's a lot of anxiety. Anxiety, anxiety, yeah. Pretty much anxiety. Yeah. So how do you support help students? I believe that the purpose of education is to help the person who grow. Yep. When we receive students, I don't know what is the discourse in other yeah. colleges, but in my college, in my department, Pretty much like, oh, okay, well. So students sometimes use that as a way not to submit as assignments mm -hmm. or just not, yeah, pretty much not to submit yeah. assignments. Sure. I understand that happens and you yeah. can be having hard times. But how do you trace the line or how do you help people really to grow when they yeah. are struggling? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think. I think you, you try to accommodate students on a case-by-case -case basis, and you try to evaluate the merits of you know, their complaint. This, these things can easily be parlayed into excuses. Right? Um, but it's also important to think about, OK, maybe I'll give you an extension on this paper, but how do we get to the point where you're not avoiding these things due to anxiety? Jonathan Haidt published an Atlantic piece several years ago that he turned into a book called Coddling of the American Mind. Basically what he argues there is that the whole sort of campus safe spaces approach mm -hmm. to dealing with uh, students that <coughs> have a hard time contending with new ideas or other challenges, that they sort of put the, put the student in, a, in bubble wrap and protect them from the rough edges of life, protect them from public argumentation, protect them from uncomfortable ideas, from whatever, is actually, if you look at it from a cognitive and behavioral therapy standpoint, the exact opposite of what you should do. So, boiling down treatment for anxiety to its most basic level, behavioral interventions for anxiety um, involve various forms of exposure therapy. Um, if I have a phobia of getting on an elevator, I'm gonna behaviorally be inclined to avoid elevators. Right? This is on the fourth floor. Okay, I'm going to you know, be a little bit winded, but I can take the stairs to the fourth floor. So I start avoiding elevators. 
and it's fine because I work on the second floor. And I, well, if I've avoided elevators for two weeks, and then I have, you know, I have a, a job interview on the 50th floor that you know starts in five minutes, and I got to get on this elevator, my anxiety level is going to be um, mild, but probably manageable. But if I've avoided elevators for two years, I'm probably priming myself for a panic attack when I get on that elevator. And the reason is the avoidant behavior confirms in my mind that this thing, this environment, or this situation is actually threatening, right? is something to be avoided. And unfortunately, the, the approach that college campuses have taken to the sort of snowflake generation that don't want to contend with some things that cause stress or some things that maybe make them mildly anxious has been the exact opposite of that, just encouraging continued avoidance, facilitating it, and kind of, and I, I think, you know, Height and his co-author were right that if you look at this from um, cognitive behavioral intervention sort of perspective, we're only making the problem worse and we're creating a, a fragile generation of students uh, that just basically learn if there's something that makes me uncomfortable, the best strategy is not to deal with it rather than you know, learning to face your fears. And there, there's graded and systematic ways you know, to do this when you're when you're doing therapy with someone that has a phobia, um, sort of walking them through the process of graded exposure. Um, but the, the end goal is basically not avoidance, but um, um, learning that no, I can get on the elevator, I can take the exam, I can write this paper, I can you know go to go to a party and socialize with people, um, and um, things are going to be okay. I I wonder if. That, that coddling of the American mind could also uh, is related to gender confusion for young young yeah. adults, and especially puberty <coughs> age. Um, what is the, well, I was gonna ask, what is the research on that? And my, but alongside of that is, I'm wondering if there is any research since the psychology associations um, seem to be the ones advocating Right. For the, you know, they make this argument like if we don't let these kids be self-determined and determine whatever gender they 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 choose, then the alternative is suicide. So that's kind yeah. of the, the narrative yeah. that, that I'm hearing. And, uh, so um, the let me start with the latter part of the question. Um, this threat of suicide if we don't affirm their stated gender has been weaponized, um, mostly against parents. Right? This, is, this is what parents hear. Well, if you don't support your kid in doing this, they're going to kill themselves and they're professionally immoral. Your, your child's blood is going to be on your hands. Um, so I hope to draft a, a report several years ago that looked at the research on what's called the social stress hypothesis, that LGBT individuals, uh, we already know they, have, they do have higher rates of suicide and other mental health problems. And the, the hypothesis, social stress hypothesis says that this is due to social stigma, this is due to the lack of affirmation. And if, if we just sort of could, could get rid of uh, transphobia and homophobia and become more accepting and embracing, then that <coughs> would solve the problem of suicide and drug addiction and depression in that population. What's an interesting hypothesis, and maybe has some plausibility to it, the problem is, it was presented in a paper many years ago, a paper which has been cited over and over and over again, but it was never presented as the conclusion of the study. It was presented precisely as a hypothesis. Um, and it, it was treated as though it had already been demonstrated. But if you actually look at research that's trying to demonstrate that that is the case, um, the hypothesis is not confirmed. And so the long-term studies that we have, we have a lot of good long-term studies on um, mental health outcomes after gender conversion uh, you know, transition, the ones that we do have show that the transition process does not resolve the mental health issues. The biggest one is uh, 700 individuals. I think the study was done in Sweden several years ago. Uh, half of them male to female, the other female to male. 10 years after surgery, uh, 
still had suicide that was 19 times the rate of the general population. Just astronomical, high rates of suicide, high rates of all-cause mortality, high rates of psychiatric hospitalizations, four times the general population, uh, for things other than gender dysphoria. So the research we have now um, doesn't support the social stress hypothesis. Um, and in the case of uh, gender dysphoria, strongly suggests that those interventions and the affirmation approach um, doesn't actually lower the risk of suicide. It's possible that it makes things worse. We don't have, I don't think we have evidence to say that, but it doesn't seem to make it better. So the weaponization of that, um, I think, is, is uh, malpractice in the way it's, it's been done. Okay, so your other question was, um, if basically the research shows that if you just take a watch and wait approach rather than the gender affirming approach in adolescents that are gender dysphoric, the majority of them um, do not identify as transgender as adults. Whereas if you take them any step down the gender affirming road, including puberty blockers, virtually all of them identify as transgender as adults. Um, so you put a kid on puberty blockers who's struggling with feeling at home in my body and feeling sort of uh, identifying with uh, my natal sex. Uh, you you don't. It's it's not. It's presented sometimes as a conservative approach that we're just giving them more time, and it's also presented as fully reversible, which is not true. But um, but actually, if you intervene in puberty and then you take them off puberty blockers at the age of 18 and they, they start engaging in normal pubertal development you know, five, six years later, you've interrupted their psychosocial development at that phase of their life. I mean, one of the ways of coming to accept your gender is just the personal experience of developing secondary sex characteristics, the changes that happen at puberty, right? So to deprive a child of that, deprives them of one of the things that helps, apparently helps most adolescents eventually to uh, identify with their male sex if they have struggled with gender identity issues earlier in life. Um, many of those uh, people grow up to identify as homosexual. And actually, interestingly, the, the gender clinic uh, in Britain, the flagship gender clinic in Britain, was shut down last year, Tavistock Clinic, not by social conservatives saying you shouldn't be doing this. It was shut down by the L's and the G's saying to the T's, you're taking these young people that are probably going to identify as gay or lesbian later in life, and you're convincing them, them that they're trans and you're doing this. It's a power grab. So, that would never happen in this country that the coalition is going to hang together I think, for political reasons, but um, and then the other thing that's relevant, uh, while we're on the topic of gender, relevant to what I was talking about in this lecture, is the phenomenon of social contagion. Um, spreading person to person through social networks, or a kind of worthier effect of highly publicized cases that get a lot of attention. Um, I think we now have pretty good evidence that this is happening in what's, what's been termed rapid onset gender dysphoria in adolescents, especially among adolescent girls. Clusters of friends all presenting at the same time, uh, saying that they identify as trans. Again, going back to when I was in residency not that long ago, um, when we studied gender dysphoria, it was this is a problem that presents in toddlers. It's not something that first manifests in, among twelve-year-old girls. It's just not the natural history of that that issue the problem. Um, in my four years of residency, I saw one patient who identified as transgender. Um, when I was consulting on the adolescent wards just a few years ago, we had a 13 bed inpatient unit that I would cover when I was on call on the weekend for adolescent patients. At any given time, three or four of the patients on that 13 bed unit were asking for 
in the research on stress, there's eustress and distress. Um, so good stress is usually short term um, and, um, and can focus an individual or a group of individuals on a particular goal and that the stress and needing to meet a deadline or to finish a project, I think all of us have this experience, can energize people um, toward, you know, putting in the effort to get something done and to move something forward. So not all stress is bad. Stress becomes bad when it becomes uh, chronic, pervasive, free-floating, when you don't have periods of rest and recuperation. That's why the, the, sort, of, the sort of rhythm of, 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 of daily, weekly, monthly plan is, is helpful in sort of managing stress. Because all of us are going to contend with stress, and not all stress is bad. Again, this, this whole helicopter approach to parenting or bubble wrap the college students so they don't have to contend with anything uncomfortable. Um, obviously, does not prepare people for dealing with stress. But yeah, there's this sort of cultural mean that um, opting out seems to be a socially appropriate way of dealing with difficulty. And I think that certainly plays into the lobby for assisted suicide and euthanasia. And if life becomes too difficult, I can just opt out. And in fact, speaking of social contagion, there have been uh, a couple of studies now from uh, David Albert Jones and David Patton in the UK looking at the effects of legalization of doctor assisted suicide, not just on rates of doctor assisted suicide, but on overall rates of suicide. As a whole, they did a study in Washington and Oregon after they passed laws permitting uh, physician assisted suicide for the terminally ill, seem to have uh, downstream effects on overall suicide rates in those cases. So, assisted suicide in euthanasia is not unrelated to the overall problem of suicide in society because you have a 13 year old girl who says, Well, I, you know, my grandma was dealing with a terminal illness, and, you know, the doctors gave her some pills to end things so she could escape her suffering. In fact, the, the families were gathered around the bedside and celebrated that decision. Well, I'm suffering intolerably, intolerably, maybe not with a terminal condition, but you know, that just means I'm going to be suffering even longer than grandma would have died probably within a few months. And she just hastened it a little bit, but I'm going to be bearing up under the burden of this medical condition or you know, my chronic depression or eating disorder or whatever it is for who knows how long, right? So it, it doesn't make any sense. And you would have to say, well, logically, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Why should he, she have the right to do this, and yet you, you don't? So the law as a teacher, the law has a pedagogical function um, in terms of shaping people's moral imagination regarding, you know, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, and, you know, logical rigor uh, this is why the, the euthanasia and assisted suicide lobby, lobby never stops at just the term of the ill. Because, you know, once you accept the principle, the, uh, the artificial safeguards or fences that you try to put up around it are arbitrary. People should be allowed based on autonomy arguments for suffering. Those are the two arguments for assisted suicide and euthanasia. Bodily autonomy, or the, the autonomy of the you know, expressive individualistic will, and intolerable pain or suffering. Once you accept those arguments, then I should the right to kill myself be limited to those who only have six months or less to live. Why should it be limited uh, only to adults or about children who are suffering? So the, the, there's kind of an ine inexorable logic to the slippery slope. You have practical slippery slope concerns um, that you know it will be hard to hard to draw, draw lines and so forth. But you also have logical slippery slope um, issues that just for the sake of consistency, um, those, arbit the, the, those arbitrary safeguards are, are going to slowly fall away once you abandon the principle that people shouldn't kill themselves. Can I, can I say something? What, do you, what role do you think fit into, into this whole story? Like, when I was in school, which is a little earlier than you, later than you, um, there was no kids with anxiety. Yeah. In my college years, there was nowhere with anxiety or stress 
Like, like that couldn't happen. Like, you go to a teacher and say, or professor and say, like, I'm, un I, I can't, like, okay, you know, you get a zero. That's it. Uh, so, what role does it feel like? Maybe this over professionalization of the. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, the, the whole issue of the medicalization of everyday life is should be a concern of ours. Um, these some of these categories can become too elastic and too expansive, such that, um, you know, you, you're, you'll know if you have a panic attack. Most people that have a full blown panic attack end up in the emergency room because they think they're dying, they're having a heart attack. I mean, it's very it's very severe and incapacitating. Mild anxiety because of everyday stress is not a mental health condition. It's a normal response to my environment. So I, I think we do have to be aware of mission creep on some of these categories in the way in which those things can be you know, politically weaponized. You know, you can't say that because it makes me anxious. Or, you know, used to facilitate a kind of irresponsibility that, um, that, uh, and, and laziness, quite frankly, lack of discipline. Um, because, you know, I, I sort of diagnose myself with a mental health condition every time I'm struggling with I think we certainly don't. We certainly don't want the medicalization of everyday life. That's not. Good. <coughs> before, this we, before we conclude, I think we have to call it an evening. I want to cede the floor to Marianne for just a couple minutes of uh, comments and questions. But first, thank Aaron for his evening talk. shaped 
the way they think and behave. Um, and one of the goals is for the people come from the family not to take it for granted. And to realize that that is something that needs to be continued and repeated and preserved from the attacks of modern culture that is not exactly what happened. So that said, I just uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Alan, again for flying here. And I hope to see a lot of you.